Optic Glass. Woo! Welcome back to Death Curse Society, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. We have got a lot to talk about. You know what? Let's go camping. For Let's Go Camping this time around, there is absolutely, positively no way we can avoid the topic that is on everyone's tongues right now. That's right. It's Candyman from Jordan Peele and director Nia DaCosta. Woo! This one's going to be fun, guys. I have a feeling. Colonel, give us your initial thoughts on Candyman. Okay, this is going to be hard to give initial thoughts. So this is going to be short, sweet, and to the fucking point because there's so much to digest for this film. Walking into the theater, seeing the trailers, I pretty much got why I was expecting. I mean, it, they pretty much set it up for you. I wasn't disappointed. I got a better movie than I thought I was going to get. That's all I'm saying. Short, sweet, to the point. There's too much to fucking eat with this movie. That's, wow. How about you, Ziggy? You got some initial thoughts on Candyman? I do. And Colonel's right. This is a trailer that spelled it out pretty much what you were going to get. And then, you know, you've heard all the hype and you've seen all the press along as we've been going with this. And, oh, man, we're going to really get it. And we all had our predictions on it and stuff. But, man, let me tell you, I, I don't see what everyone's complaining about. This is a decent movie. Maybe not the best in the thing here, the whole run of Candyman films. But, again, Jordan Peele, director aside on this project, his writing is felt here, and thus the things he's trying to show you, it's not too bad, man. I don't, what? They're pointing out real fucking problems in the world here, so I don't see what the fuck you're all getting on about with this and getting all upset for. What we got here is a revival of a great horror franchise, and welcome back, man. We're going to get into that controversy a little bit later. I enjoyed this film. I enjoyed the story that was there. There were some elements of it that I did not necessarily appreciate, but I do like the ties that it had to the original. And I actually don't even mind where they're trying to take this for future films. Like you guys, I'm going to leave it short and sweet, and that's going to be my initial thoughts. So let's get into the meat of it. Ziggy, Anthony McCoy returns to Cabrini and starts to transform into the new Candyman. What did you think of the performance by Yahya Abdul-Mateen II and that character? You know, we always are hard on acting in movies like this, and this would have been no exception, but the performances here are pretty fucking solid all the way top to bottom, and uh, I found him to be very good. I uh, was digging the way he was progressing into it, although if you ever get stung by a bee and you start your hand starts to look like that, go see a doctor. That's This isn't something you want to sleep on when your shit is looking like that. You may have an infection, or you may be becoming a vengeance demon to come back, so you better... Get that looked at, get it checked out, get a nice topical ointment, and uh, you should be okay. But yeah, he was great. He was really good. If the entire right side of your body starts turning into what looks like a beehive, yes. best go get yourself to the health clinic. You got an STD, bitch. I don't know what's wrong with you. I think he did a great job. Um, I think he was probably one of the better ones in the cast, in my opinion. He portrayed kind of this dive into madness so well. So fucking well. And it also makes sense of to the bee sting where it gets really fucked up. He was obsessed with his art. He had to, that's all he cared about. Or yeah. these paintings that later on in the movie, spoiler alert, those are going to be full of spoilers. It's kind of every iteration of Candyman throughout the years, which I was like, oh. But yeah, like for me, like, he was the best one out of the whole movie. I have some complaints about uh, a couple others, but we'll get to those, but they don't matter. We're talking about Anthony right now, the character. The only complaint, this isn't even him, this is the film, because there were points in the film where the plot holes got a little thin could we have gotten a little bit more with the interaction from his mother instead of him just what happened they just they, they, they just blew such a fucking great opportunity there i know <laughs> i was like I, what the fuck they were trying to put that uh, he's kind of blowing her off a little bit or he forgot to go to dinner with her and he doesn't take her phone calls they were putting that off because they wanted that anticipation of the audience to you know 
because hell, I kept leaning over to the, my friend that I went with, and I was just like, "Boy needs to talk to his mama." <laughs> that's that's what needs to happen. I need to see this right now. And finally, when it does happen, it's a cool scene, but it was too short. I wanted Vanessa Williams more. Too short and too late, as far as the story goes. Like he was fucked. Anthony was gone. She didn't have Anthony anymore. He was he was completely break, taken over at that point. That's the last straw that broke that camel's back. So did you like Vanessa Williams' return? And did you like how they handled that part of the story and the secret that she kept to protect Anthony? Did you like that, Colonel? I love Vanessa Williams' return. Granted, she was probably one of the weaker roles for me in the movie. Really? Really. I just felt like she did a good job. Just the chops weren't there. I felt like I was watching Vanessa Williams in 1992. Performance-wise, she didn't gotten better, I guess you would say. I want a little more emotion out of her. It just, it just didn't seem real on her end for me. Maybe that was one of the few scenes that Nia DaCosta and Jordan Peele were just like, maybe you need to keep it a little more subtle this time. Because subtlety is not really present in this movie much. No, not at all. Ziggy, what about you? Were you excited about Vanessa Williams' return and that secret? That scene to me just served what it was supposed to do is confirm that this was indeed the child that was rescued from the fire at the end of Candyman 1, which they that was fine, and I'm okay with that in that aspect. But you guys are right. They could have really added some emotion into that scene and probably, you know what I mean, made it just sting a little bit more that she's got to let him go now when he walks out without looking back and shit. So, yeah, there could have been more to it, but it did absolutely serve its purpose and point in the movie. Well, a lot of people were irritated that the new film would change the backstory of Candyman when they started hearing the trailer and the, the voiceover from uh, Burke talking about it was this guy just handing out candy and had razor blades and the cops came. Blah, blah, blah. So a lot of people were pissed off about that, if you remember a couple months ago when the trailer dropped. But did they really change the backstory? And I'm going to call it. Colonel nailed it a couple months ago when we did our trailer review. He nailed it by calling Candyman the vengeful spirit for each era. Here's the clip. It looks like, like so they're changing the mythology, which I'm okay with. Maybe, you know, the Candyman is the vengeful spirit for each era. You know what I mean? Maybe Candyman does change to right the wrongs as time goes on. Ziggy, how did that play for you? I'll get back to Colonel here in a little bit so he can, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm going to gloat. Oh, I know you are. He's breaking his arm over there, patting himself on the back. No, uh, listen, man, uh, you guys were right, and I absolutely appreciated the fact that there is, you know, a different Candyman representing all these horrible things across the years. Can't really say, we don't want to spoil it all, but everybody is acknowledged. It's very cool, and they've opened the door to more stories to tell with this angle. I like it. I thought it was cool. Yeah, with that, they could do a lot with that by going back and doing kind of prequels even you know, with the other stories that they kind of allude to. And I, I like that fact. So, Colonel, throwing it to you. Uh, uh, there we go. That's all you're going to get out of me. Fuck it. I mean, I don't think it was that hard to get that one right. But I, mean, I loved it. I really did. You guys know, we have so many spinoffs from this now. Um, and it makes sense. I mean, the urban legend changes through the generations. Again, there are plot holes in this movie. You know, back to 92 when Anthony was kidnapped, it was still you know, the original Candyman. And you look at his paintings, he's got three or four different ones. But let's be honest, people aren't going to remember that. And, you know, the Tony Todd Candyman anymore. They're going to remember the, the Candyman with the razor blades. Got, you know, was hiding in the walls of the projects, the affordable housing. So it makes perfect sense. And I really dug it. And then how they tied it all together was fucking perfect, too. I mean, that, oh, wow. All right. Seems like you guys were pretty impressed by this. I'm, I'm liking this. Oh, I have issues with a couple of things. Okay. Well, let's get into that here in a second. But you just mentioned something. I recently watched Candyman, the 1992 version again, right before I went to see this film. And it's kind of a throwaway scene, but there's a scene where Helen is exploring the empty apartments in Cabrini, and she comes across on the ground a little pile of candy and one of them has a razor blade in it. A lot of people seem to have forgotten that. I'll be honest. I did until I recently watched it again. But I don't know if in 1992 they were alluding to the, the gangster that attacks Helen in the bathroom as maybe that being 
the guy that's doing that or if it's somebody else entirely. Do you guys have any opinion about that, Colonel? Do you think that was something that they meant in there? I'm sure it was. Uh, it had to have been. It's too much of a coincidence because, you know, the 92 version, you got the candy in there with the razor blade in it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that's you know, sweets for the sweet. They're trying to kill Candyman with that razor blade. But you get this one, it makes perfect sense. And when they're writing this script, they're, I'm sure they're rewatching it. They're not doing it off memory. And Jordan Peele's probably like, huh. And that little light bulb of his went off. And that makes too much sense to be a coincidence. I agree. I think they saw that as well and, and or at least knew about it already and said we're going to definitely take this angle into our story and it does feed into this particular candy man that we meet at the beginning of the film but it's muddled with the the tony todd stuff i mean what are you gonna do they they <laughs> it's been this many years and i do think just like jordan peele with us and his story of the underground clones and everything he has coming hopefully He's got more to do with Candyman and these other scenarios again. So I, who the fuck knows? But I mean, that's that's what I think anyway. But we'll see. I fucking loved the paintings, too. He was painted the actual portraits. Mm -hmm. Those were fucking wild, man. Yeah. Those should be made into prints or something that could be sold later. I hope they are. Yeah. I did just see Waxwork Records are releasing the soundtrack, which is phenomenal, by the way. It was excellent. One of the covers is the portrait. I don't know if they're going to have all the portraits in different versions and shit, but man, just looking at that cover, I was like, fuck. Nice. I think this is going to be a, a must get. All right. Well, you guys have both talked about plot holes that you didn't like. Ziggy, I'm going to start with you. What were some that <laughs> they missed the mark on? What they do? What they fuck up? Okay. I'm just going to get right to it. And I, I expect a lot of you out there not to agree with me on this, but the character of Burke the, the motivation and attachment to the actual story, it really reminded me of the same kind of way Dr. Sartanian was in Halloween 2018. I mean, it was there, but you know what I mean? That kind of fucked it up for me, man. Him actually facilitating it and causing it all to happen. I didn't like that choice, man. It was just too fucking hokey. It was the only part I was just kind of, all right, thank you, Dr. Sartain. This was one of the lazy plot points of the movie, I think. Just the fact that it was, I mean, that entire character almost. Because I know you've got to have some kind of convenient meeting where you, oh, hey, the new character meets somebody that's been there for a while and he gets some of the backstory. How convenient that they just happen to meet while he's walking around Cabrini Green, you know, and taking pictures. Colonel, do you agree with him on that? Oh, fuck yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was so lazy to set up the story. and. It's like Anthony became so obsessed with the subject after pretty much like one meeting with this guy. The legend of Candyman I thought was lazy throughout this whole movie. I mean, he goes to the university, he's listening to Helen's tape. He's up, like he did like no, hardly any research into this fucking shit. He's like, I'm going to do a whole series about the Candyman. Like they should have dug a little deeper into that legend. I really thought they missed the mark on that one. It's the where the 1992 Candyman. They dug fucking deep. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much the whole movie was about his investigation and to the legend of Candyman. Where this one's like, oh yeah, Candyman says his name five times in the mirror and he'll take it out and then, oh, well, I'm bringing him back. <laughs> I can say as far as his obsession stuff with the painting and everything, as a musician, I felt that. We've all sat there and obsessed over a piece of music like that and just got so focused on shit like that. So I, I thought they got that part right of his obsession. Yeah, you know, well, not the cause of it. Yes, the cause of it is is what you're right. It's too thin. Yeah. Well, like I, said, I wasn't saying anything about his obsession. It, yeah. to me, it was just where's where's your fucking research? I know music right. you can listen, and but if you're doing this character, this legend, you're only going back thirty years worth of history, or we'll say fifty because we'll go back to the seventies for this two hundred year old legend. I mean, it's like, eh. yeah, because he was cold going into it. He knew nothing about it, you know, until the the uh, until, girlfriend's you know, the brother in law or whatever yeah, started telling him, and they, oh, what's this, you know, and. And here comes Burke, thin in the fabric, right, right. there. there Just like they said in the movie. Very nice. Oh. Let's get into it, because this is the thing that everybody's talking about. Social, political message that is embedded in this movie. Embedded might not be necessarily the best word. It's kind of <laughs> sprinkled on top, like, like cheese. Like when you go to Olive Garden and they're like, hey, would you like some shredded cheese on your soup or salad? Yeah, just say when, when you want it. And the guy just keeps on a-cranking and keeps on a-cranking. In that same video, the colonel got the evolution of Candyman correct. I made a prediction that I thought Jordan Peele would crank up 
the social message in this. And personally, I think I was correct because it was pretty heavy handed. But did you guys feel it was heavier than, say, Get Out or Us? And was it appropriate for the times? Colonel. All right. Well, I like your analogy of, you know, the shredded cheese. Now, Olive Garden. So I'm going to continue with that. Let's flash back to 1992 Candyman, as well as a ton of other horror movies. And I'll add Us and Get Out with it. The message is there, but it's buried in the layers of the lasagna. Yes. You know it's there, but you can't really see it. As where Jordan Peele, what I've noticed he likes to do with projects he produces, that's when he's like, all right, let's put this cheese on top and throw it on there. So it's almost like if there's any backlash, it doesn't fall on him. I don't think that's his point, but I mean, I know he's done with the Twilight Zone and obviously now you know, Candyman. It's there, but it fits. I think it wasn't too much. If you're going to do this with a horror icon, Candyman is the horror icon to do it with because let's go back to 92 and that lasagna. That same message is there. Sure. Let's flash forward to you know, Candyman 2, Farewell to the Flesh. That message is a little bit more towards the top. We're going to ignore Candyman 3. It's been there this whole time. Why are people surprised and bitching about this? So, of course, they're going to use this to tell their story and their points of view. Why the fuck are people bitching about this? The character, if you're going to have a woke horror film, which I don't think this was, this is the one to do it with. And they did it fucking perfect. Yeah, it was real fucking heavy, but you know, sometimes you need a little extra sauce, you know what I mean? To really drive that fucking point around. It felt a little heavy handed to me. It didn't necessarily affect my overall enjoyment of the film. It did kind of take me out of it a little bit because like you mentioned in 92, there's basically two lines in the entire movie that are just kind of like sprinkled there to, to let you know this is a black film. Now, granted, keep in, keep in mind, 1992 was written and directed by white folk. It was trying to tell sort of the black perspective and the black story. But like you mentioned in our trailer review, it's the white woman that comes in and saves the day in Candyman 1992. But this one seemed a little bit extra cheesy. I'll just put it that way. And I don't mean, you know, hokey. I mean, the Olive Garden reference. Ziggy, what did you think? Was it too heavy-handed or was it just right, the way Colonel thinks? Just right isn't the right word either, but too heavy? No. Uh, what they did here, just like with Get Out, just like with Us, Jordan Peele directed those, yes. This one he did not, but he did co-write it. His touch is prominent here. You can feel it. You can almost see him standing in the corner and you walk in the room and he goes, and then he points over with what you're supposed to be looking at and paying attention to without fucking making a flashing lights and sirens and everything. Like the movie that shall not be named, which I'll be honest, when I first walked into this thing, I thought that's what I was going to get. So I have to say hats off to Jordan Peele. I'm sure he got probably some heavier stuff like you're saying with the triple cheese. And he went, you know what? Let's slick this up and kind of do some reverse entendres on these things with, you know, like when he's talking to the critic and she's mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, people like you totally get this. You're the, you're the, the cause of this. And he's like, excuse me? She's like, painters. You know, and like, right. I love it, man. I, I like that line. I don't think at all this was too heavy. It's it, if you saw Get Out and Us, it's exactly the same thing, in my opinion. I don't see why everyone is getting in their fucking panties in a bunch over this. It's it's a real problem, and they addressed it. They did not beat you over the head with it. I don't understand where that's coming from. I don't get it. See, I kind of thought they did kind of beat you over the head with it a little bit more in this one. Not. Yeah. Not to the point, like I said, not to the point that it was overall a pain in the ass like the movie that, that shot. Mm. But it was closer to that than, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, BC is up here. Get Out and Us are kind of down here. I would say Candyman is a little bit closer to BC than it is yeah. Get Out and Us. I'll they split use, the difference. The term racist white people more than a couple times, which didn't bother me. It's them telling their story. And again, where is the fucking lie? But they use that term a few times in the first act of that movie. I mean, they were really beating you in the head. Over. Now, they might have pulled back the second and third acts mm -hmm. to an extent. But yeah, that first act, it was like that meme of the dog conquering people with the ball back. Was, uh, I, I just love the way they approach it i love the pretentious idiot art fucking crowd that the way they try to tell you that this is why things are the way it is with them their high horse fucking shit that's fine i love that from that angle that it's just all in the way you tell it to me man and how they did it here i'll split the difference with you between that movie we don't name and that bottom one i'll go in the middle but i ain't going any higher right in the middle, middle. Right in the middle. wow all right. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I didn't feel that way, and I. I still feel this was enough of a Candyman experience where it fits. 
To me, I think this is probably the second best in the series. I'll say it. Let's get into that because that's the next point I want to kind of make. Like I said, I think it was a little more heavy handed, but it didn't take me out of the film, I should say. So let's go back to Candyman 1992. Gentrification was kind of a big thing at that point in time. We had just had the Rodney King beating in L.A. in the year previous. We were going through the trial. There were the riots. That was kind of the first time that I remember in my lifetime anyway that a police brutality case was coming to light. There's tons of other examples throughout history, but this was the one that that really took a national spotlight, international spotlight, and just broadcast it over the world. Now, let's fast forward 30 years to this Candyman. Was the conversation elevated and more in your face, like I'm saying, because there are so many more issues going on, you know, and the fact that they even use the tag name, say his name, which is something they use on marches to remember those that are killed. Is that why the message was a little bit boosted? Because that's just the times and the sign of the times that we are in. Ziggy? I can totally agree with everything you just said without shitting at all on my own point. I'm absolutely, it's all how you say it, but you said it right there with all the things that have happened in the years since that first movie and that tagline. They're not that slick. We figured it out. We know. But yeah, of course, 100% yes. Everything you just said. I can't argue one thing about it. I love the tagline. And especially after seeing the movie, going back and thinking about it again, I love the tagline. Because that was one of the things that drove me nuts about the trailer was the fact that they said that so many times. Like, say his name, say his name. I dare you to say his name. Now, after I've seen the movie and I get the, you know, I see the full message. I'm like, that's fucking cool as shit. Colonel, any thoughts on that at all? I can't really add any more to it because you practically fucking nailed it which is why i say they're beating you over the head with it i mean let's not forget just a little over a year ago there's an eight minute video we all seen a man get fucking murdered on the street not that long ago uh, a little more in my neck of the woods a couple hours away louisville kentucky brianna taylor you know innocent fucking killings for no fucking reason especially you know george floyd like this one calls the unrest because we've fucking seen it we've been known it's been happening for years we'll go back to 91 rodney king we've seen these cops beating this man on the street they went to court and found them fucking guilty i mean to me the shame of all this is close to 30 years from the original movie and it's the same fucking message which is why like in the movie they said the more things change the more things stay the same again another pointing out that they're beating you over the head with this fucking message and i think it needs to be said and it is like, probably the fucking times is what we're dealing with i mean again a year ago civil unrest all across the country and i know i got a might have a little bit different point of view on this compared to you two guys maybe if i wasn't in that situation i might have a different point of view on it but i'm worried that you know when one of my kids goes out when she's a teenager, an adult, what the fuck she's going to deal with the other one? I'm kind of like, yeah, she'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, that's a shame, but it's true. I get it, man. See, I doubt you would have a different frame of mind about it or a different opinion about it because you know why? You're a decent fucking human being. I mean, on the show, you're an asshole, but you're a decent human being, man. I'll be, I'll say it. I don't mean to out you. I almost feel like I'm just, yeah, all right, Colonel's gay. <laughs> I almost feel like I gave it away. But... <laughs> He is. He's a nice guy, guys. Online, we posted a poll on Facebook asking, was the message too much or was it just right for the times? An overwhelming response, at least voting wise, was it was just right. Some of the comments got a little hairy <laughs> and there were a few debates back and forth. Colonel, do you think the message is elevated from 1992 the way they stated it? to 2021 the way they stated it because we're not listening of course i mean it kind of goes back to what i just said that you know 30 years later same fucking message and it's been going on for longer than 30 years i mean well i'll go back to 1865 i mean especially in certain parts of this country it's been an issue in this country since it's been fucking founded and it's, it's amazing to me that in almost 200 years we still haven't figured it out it pisses me off honestly <laughs> it's like if someone's an asshole they're an asshole that's all you should judge people on you're an asshole well fuck you Oh, you're a good person. Cool. It doesn't fucking matter. Unfortunately, another product of our times I didn't like in our comment section. Luckily, someone was like, fuck this, I'm out. And it's gone, thank goodness. Was that you can't even debate this. I have no problem with people saying, oh, that's too much for me. You can have a friendly debate. But unfortunately, in our times, people don't want to have friendly debates. If you don't think like them, you're fucking wrong. Here's why you're an idiot. But then it can get really uncivil quick. It did. Nothing's going to change when we act like that, people. You have to be willing to listen to each other. 
Let me rephrase the way I asked that question. Not necessarily because we're not listening, but because a very loud minority of us are willfully ignorant to it and don't want to change. I mean, that's part of it too. It's just, this isn't a black and white answer. I can't give you a black and white. It's, there's so much fucking gray here. I mean, I'll take something that's not even a topic that we're discussing. I mean, we're all big football fans. I know me and Zag are. People kneeling about throwing a fit. I ain't going to watch the NFL because they're kneeling during the flag. Kneeling during the flag was never, never anti-American. It was against police brutality and equal fucking rights. And people still hold on to this shit because everything in this country gets fucking politicized, right or fucking wrong anymore. It doesn't matter if it's kneeling for a flag, basic human rights, or a fucking pandemic. Or the vaccine. Yeah, yeah, that, that kind of gets lumped into the pandemic. Unfortunately, everything is so fucking politicized. You're right, we're wrong in this fucking country right now. It's fucking sickening, man. It's getting to the point where it's like, I'm fucking about done with people in general. <laughs> Well, as long as we can still do this from time, you know, every couple I'll of still years. pop in from down now. Yeah, but other than that, fuck you guys. I don't want to do with you. <laughs> I'm going to go live in a bunker. Ziggy? You know what I really think? I think some very smart and powerful people of color are rising up through the ranks and getting into places where they can get these projects made now and out into the main general big public like that. So we're getting there as snails fucking crawl as a pace. And shit is fucking crumbling around as we're getting there, man. But we're trying, you know? But I, I really think that's the source of it. And I do think the volume needs to be turned up a little bit. Let me just say it like this. My analogy is, you know, those revolving doors in like a front of a big fancy hotel where there's five or six different slots and they're spinning? Idiocracy covers all genres and colors and races. It's, it's just there. Stupidity exists. It's just there. We have to deal with it. We got to find a way. We're all in this together, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I know that's the root of the message at this here. I don't see a problem with telling a story this way to help open up some eyes. Maybe you got to look in the mirror yourself. Don't say Candyman, of course, but just take a look and maybe think and actually listen to what's being said and maybe think, why is it being said that way? We've all got to do that, man. That's yeah. just what I feel. That's just that's two cents from Zag right now. Yeah, I'm not necessarily. Well, no, I am trying to get a little deep on this because that's what I love about our discussions. And that's what I love about our discussions with even the fans when they chime in. Most of it, with our fans at least, is respectful, is thought-provoking, is kind of understanding where we're coming from. And that's one of the things I found funny about the Facebook posts. Like, on our page, it's pretty cool. No tirades, no nothing. It's when we shared it to one of the other groups, or a couple other groups, Oof. just general horror groups that have thousands of, of members, yeah. I get that. It gets seen by more eyes, clearly. That's when the discussion got ugly. You can think what you want and everything, but dude, if somebody doesn't agree with your view of life and how it plays out, man, the oldest one of them all, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Build a better mousetrap. Walk a mile in their shoes. It's so simple that it's it's complicating to some, It's and that's frustrating, you know? That's the perfect analogy right there. It's so complicated, it's simple. Well, you know what? I think that's enough talking about this. Let's get to the ratings. Ziggy, you want to start us with a rating for Candyman 2021? I sat out on Friday night to see this, caught the last showing at my local theater that I've seen all the 80s classics at, all those double features way back when in the 80s. And uh, we made it about 49 minutes into it, and the fucking power went out. And, you know, they're not going to wait around. It's already 1230 at night. They want to get the fuck out. Here's your free passes. Beat it. Got up this morning, ready to go. Made sure they had power, got all the way there. Yep, got one at 10 a.m. Boom, I have time to have breakfast still and collect my thoughts before we go on the air today. I'm standing at the front door with my free pass. Every fucking door is locked. There's no human action in there whatsoever. No covers. Everything's still covered with tarps and shit. So, okay, I stood there 10 minutes, didn't see nobody. I went to my other theater, paid the six bucks, and enjoyed the movie full theater to myself at 10.30 in the morning. It was worth it. Two and a half theaters and over three days to see it and get it all done, but I did it. Candyman is worth your time to see. You could probably tune out the fucking ham-handed messages if you want to and just kind of focus in on what's going on, but it's shot great. It looks good. He's always there in the reflections, just so subtly everywhere you look. And it's very cool, man. Candyman, I'm going to give a six and a half. I kind of expected more, but a little bit more, maybe a seven, but I'm saying six and a half. No, 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 no. I, I go to that Burke scene, man, and that, uh, oh, if they wouldn't have done that. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking an eight here. Colonel. 
like Zach said, you can ignore the overhanded messages. They're pretty hard to ignore, but if you want to, fuck it. That's what's going to make you see this movie, fucking ignore it. Again, I thought the message was right for the times. The right movie to do it. It was shot great. The gore, when we got a couple close-up scenes, was fucking fantastic. A little heavy on the CGI for the bees. Tony Todd only wishes he was so lucky. Okay? <laughs> now, the score, I know Zag mentioned this. Dude, I did not care for the score a whole hell of a lot. And I know a lot of people were ranting and raving about the score. It's my own fault because you cannot touch the original score for the 1992 film. Never going to fucking happen. So I'm being a little harsh on the score. It was good. It was okay, but it wasn't fucking great. And I really like some of the directions she took it. I don't know about you guys, but like the opening of the MGM and Brian and all that. I was like, man, I think the movie's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a little bit to realize it was like a mirrored reflection. I was like, the trailers were fine. What, what the hell? But I, I like that. And I like how you're going through Chicago. It's like you're laying down on a stretcher, staring up at the cloudy sky and the skyscrapers. I really like the direction she took this in at certain points. Fucking loved it. Plot does get a little thin at points. Uh, like Zach said, I could download Burke. And man, that ending, I don't give a fuck. Spoiler, might want to skip the crank on this one. Just revealing Tony Todd at the end and hearing his voice was the, oh, I've been waiting an hour and a half for this. I was like, yes. Was that too little of Tony? I honestly of I think it was a little too little, but we got something and we confirmed it here first. People, Death Curse Society, like three years ago, we confirmed years it. Ago, uh, after we, we didn't talk to him and cameras went down and I asked him, are we going to see you in a cameo in the new Candyman remake? He said to me, ah, uh, well, I, uh, well, you know. And I said, okay, you can't say, I get it, I get it. He's like, yeah, you know, and then like, he just got the littlest smile on his face. And uh, we, we both started laughing, Colonel and I, and he's like, all right. He was like, they're on their third script right now. It's done. And he did get a call, and that's all he would say. So, but it does look good that we may see the original Candyman appearing in the new. So, remake. all that being said, score wise, I've been thinking about this hard since I left the movie. So, I try to let that high die down if I wanted to give it a proper grade. I really liked it. I didn't love it. I'm still going to give it an eight. Ooh. Maybe it's because we've been seeing a lot of shit for a long time and we finally got something good. Right. I might be overhyping it in my head, but. I can't agree with you more on some of the direction of Nia da Costa. I thought that was clever. It was basically a mirror of how 92 started. You know, 92, we got the drone shot basically shooting down on the streets and over Chicago. And this one, we're looking up. As soon as that started, I just got this big, stupid smile on my face. My friend is like, what the fuck are you thinking now? You know, <laughs> you overanalyzing piece of shit. Stop this. <laughs> you know? Most of the performances were good. Like you guys have mentioned, the Burke plot hole is a gaping wound that is kind of hard to get around. And I'm kind of shocked it was so badly written. I love the story. I thought the story was perfect as a continuation. The people that are complaining about this and the people that are especially the people complaining about the story having a socio-political slant to it, horror says things about the times that we are in. All art does. Movies, music, paintings. It says stuff about the times that we are in. There's a lot good about this film. I am going to stick to my point that I think this was a little bit heavier handed than some appeals other work. It crossed that line for me just enough. I'm going to give it a seven and a half. I mean, it's still a great film. Enjoy the movie. Maybe enjoy the message. Maybe learn something from the message. Or just ignore the message and just watch the fucking movie. Soapbox off. <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for Let's Go Camping and our Candyman review. Stick around. We got more Death Curse Society and some stories around the campfire coming your way real soon. Woo! Woo! Hey, what's up everybody? Live from Horror Hounds, Cincinnati. I just want to give you tipsters a big tip. I want you to listen to, tune in, or tune out to Death Curse Society. Twice a month, available on YouTube. Okay, it's a podcast you want to talk to and listen to and be a part of. Death Curse Society. Listen to what I'm telling you. God bless everybody.
Death Curse Society has just become an associate producer on the film. Yes. Bravo. Bravo. Death Curse Society, guys, is so awesome. Um, I met the guys, all three of the guys, at Indianapolis last year for Horror uh, Horror Hound. And I met those dudes, and I got to tell you, like, I hung out with them. We took pictures. I signed some stuff. They gave me a T-shirt. It was was awesome. awesome. They are awesome guys. So... Uh, super cool. I am so glad to have them on board this this campaign and also on board the film. And now they are going to be IMDb credited uh, as producers on this movie. Hook. Red round. Red round. It's my Candyman hook. <laughs> Your Candyman hook is weak, son. I give out penny candies. What I can't help. It's all got. Very nice. Hang on a second. Shut up! <laughs> yeah, it gives me a chance to get a drink. There's me an outtake. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on a second. Yo! <laughs> you can hear him up there rousing the dog up or something. Sure. Blade Crank's acting. I'm sure that's a fucking net question. So we'll just end the plot point. Yeah. <laughs> Move on. Here it comes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's coming, baby. We've seen this man get fucking beat. <sighs> Hold on. Who is it? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> There's a part of me right now that is is picturing Jordan Peele on the set, watching a scene going on, and just sitting in a, All right, uh, let's do that again, but make it blacker. Let's go. <laughs> do it again. Yeah, there's part of me that sees that, but then I don't know, you know? I, I don't think he would, but... It almost feels like a Key and Peele sketch to me. <laughs> wow, how, how fucking meta would that be? Wow. Hey, thanks, guys, for watching Death Curse Society. This is Red Crank here. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to go up here, hit that subscription button. Make sure to hit that bell, too, so you get a notification whenever we drop some new videos. And speaking of different videos, bam, right over here, we got a couple for you to check out as well. Check these out. Keep watching Death Curse Society. Thanks for tuning in. Woo!